Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to be here. What a special day we have here today. It's Mother's Day, and we're very excited. We're going to have a lighthearted sermon today, speaking about various mothers of history and ones in the Bible. And a, we're going to point out a specific one that we'll have a lesson with. But it's a lighthearted sermon, and I think that you're going to enjoy it. We're excited about the day, and we're just going to start right now. We're on our, I don't know what number of taping this is. We're waiting for this, this uh, virus thing to finally end so we can go back to normal and everything. But we're going to go ahead and start right now. If we can sing together, we're going to do one called In the Secret. Here we go. <laughs> Turn this service over to you right now, Lord, 
And in Jesus' name we pray. Right now we have a song we're going to do called Come Into That Presence. It goes like this.
verses 13 through 17. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts 
and establish you in every good word and work. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Praise the Lord. We're talking about being good Christians, but yet it's Mother's Day, and we are talking about persistent mothers and what it means to be close to the Lord and be a persistent mother. <clears throat> right now is our time for giving, and uh, of course, we're not here, and so I pray that everybody would give with a whole heart so that they might be blessed by the Lord. We're going to sing another song right now here called The King of My Heart. And it goes like this. It's a, uh, okay. it's a uh, 
one called Mom's Goggles. Here we go. Are you guys sure you got this? Yeah. The twins are plugged in, baby's asleep. I'm working this yet. For men. Besides, I bumped into Chuck Norris at a pizza hut once. I think his powers rubbed off on me. Get out of here. Go on, enjoy your mommy getaway weekend. Oh, this weekend was a bad idea. Remember what happened last time we watched the kids? I'm not a pinata! <laughs> yeah, we're gonna need help. Warning, use of this product may alter your perception of reality. <sighs> All right, everything looks the same. This is a joke. taste of what God's love could look like. My mom, Mr. T, and my mom. Anyway, I, I just think God gave moms a special way of looking at things. Hey, honey. Hey, how's it going at home? It's all good. Guess she could say I'm um, starting to catch a glimpse of what your world looks like. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Mama. Hold on, your daughter wants to say something to you. I think Mama. She says she misses you. 
and she realizes how important you are to life. And she doesn't know how you do it. And she knows that she can't make it without you. She said all that. I don't know if she said it. But it's what I want to say. I should have said it a lot sooner. I thank God for you. The twins. No, um, it, it was nothing. We, we have to go, okay? Um, lo love you, mommy. Mom's got it. That's interesting anyway. That was quite cute, I thought. That's pretty nice. Well, today we are talking about Mother's Day today, and uh, the, the sermon is Persistent Mothers, basically. And we are going to be in Matthew 15, and so hopefully at home and everything will be ready in Matthew 15. We're going to have a lot of scriptures, but we have a few today. And then we're going to be thinking about mothers, and we're going to be pointing out some of the mothers in the Bible, some, and a particular one in the Bible that we're going to end up with. And we're going to be looking at some mothers from our history and everything, too. You know, it makes me think of a story. The teacher gave her fifth grade a class an assignment, and she said, get their parents to tell them a story with a moral at the end of it. Well, the next day, the kids came back, and one by one, they began to tell their stories. They were all regular types of stuff, you know, about spilled milk and pennies saved and things. But then the teacher realized that only Janie was left. And she said, Janie, do you have a story to share? And she said, yes, ma'am. My daddy told me about a story about my mommy. And she was a marine pilot in Desert Storm. And her plane got hit and she had to bail out over enemy territory. And all she had was a flask of whiskey and a pistol and a survival knife. She drank the whiskey on the way down so the bottle wouldn't break, and then she parachuted right into the middle of 20 Iraqi troops. She shot 15 of them with a pistol until she ran out of bullets. Then she killed four more with a knife till the blade broke, and then she killed the last Iraqi with her bare hands. Good heavens, said the horrified teacher. What did your daddy tell you was the moral of this horrible story? He said, don't mess with mommy when she's been drinking. <laughs> those stories, those stories, I don't know. Well, we're going to be thinking about Mother's Day today, but we're going to go to God in prayer as we really think about some mothers in history and mothers in the Bible. Let's go ahead and bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We love you, Lord, and we're just so thankful for mothers. We just pray that you would just open this message up, open their ears and hearts and minds up, Lord, and help them to to see what you're trying to get across to them. Help them to understand the persistence of prayer and just help them to understand what a wonderful thing, a blessing a mother is. So we thank you again, Lord, and we pray, pray that you would just anoint this message and touch the hearts, and we thank you again. We ask for these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I think we can all think back to certain things that our moms used to say to us, obvious things like take the trash out or pick up your room or do your homework or wear clean underwear and things like that. And we don't want to forget the classic mom saying, if all the kids jumped off the cliff, would you jump too? You know, today I have a list of a few things that mothers would never say. This is a list of some things that mothers would never say, like first one here. Here we go. Be good for your birthday, and I'll buy you a motorcycle. Here's another one that mothers would probably never say. How on earth can you see that TV when you're sitting so far back? Yeah. Here's one. Go ahead and keep that stray dog, honey. I'll be glad to feed him and watch him every day. Here's another one that mothers wouldn't say. The curfew is just a general time to shoot for. It's not like I'm running a prison around here. Here's another one that mothers would never say. Let me smell that shirt. Oh, it's okay. You can wear it another week. Here's one. I think a cluttered bedroom is a sign of creativity. Here's one. Oh, yeah, I used to skip school, too, so I understand. 
Just leave all the lights on. It makes the house all cheery. How about, could you turn the music up louder so I could enjoy it too? That's a good one. Here's one. No, I don't have a tissue with me. Just use your sleeve. <laughs> and here's one that mothers would never say. Well, if Josh's mom says it's okay, yeah, it's okay with me too. And here, the last one, finally, that mothers would probably never say. Run, bring me the scissors, hurry. <laughs> and that's some things that mothers wouldn't say. <laughs> now, it's been said that God couldn't be everywhere, so he created mothers. And of course, that is not theologically correct because God is everywhere. But it makes, it makes the point about the importance and the influence of a mom. It has been said that one ounce of mother is often worth more than a ton of clergy. I suppose that we all could think of an impact that your mother or your grandfather or whatever had on your life. There's people in history. I know George Washington said to his mother, she was the greatest teacher I ever had. Abraham Lincoln said, all that I am and that I hope to be, I owe it all to my angel mother. Here's one. President Theodore Roosevelt said, and this I quote, when it is all said, it is the mother and the mother only that is a better citizen than the soldier who fights for his country. The successful mother is the one who does her part in raising and training of her boys and girls to be men and women of the next generation and have a greater use in the community and occupies a more honorable as well as important position than any man in it. The mother is the one supreme asset of the national life. She is more important by far than the successful statesman, businessman, or scientist, unquote. That's pretty good. Here's one from Ronald Reagan who said, From my mother I learned the value of prayer and how to have dreams and how to believe that they would come true. This is really nice. But mothers are so important that it just seems so logical to have a Mother's Day celebration. They're the ones that give all the children their first guidance and counsel and really can determine how soon they come to the Lord, which is really their main responsibility. And usually early faith is all because of a mother's influence. But in all history of all great men, 99% of the time, greatness stems from a great mom. In the Bible, there is a number of mothers mentioned. So today, I thought before we look at one specific story of a mother in the Bible, I thought that I would go ahead and mention a few of the moms that are in it and what they went through and had to endure. You may find them interesting. And since it's on tape, you might go back through it and try to think of some of the mothers that you might want to look at and research yourself. And maybe you might want to seek them out yourself. And so we see, first of all, on your outline, we're going to start off that Eve is the first mother. <clears throat> she had Cain and Abel, and here's her situation. She lost both of them in one day. Cain killed Abel, and, uh, and Cain was sent away with a curse. And so we see that she lost both of them in one day. And then we see after the flood, the beginning of the Jewish nation, we have Sarah, which was Abraham's wife, and they had Isaac whose name means laughter. Oh, what joy it was for them because she had had him after being barren and she was old and sadly, not until she leaned on her own understanding having her maidservant Hagar have Abraham's baby Ishmael. Oh, God didn't want that, but she jumped the gun and hurried. Sarah didn't wait and so Hagar, Sarah's slave, on your outline, had Ishmael, the father of the Arabic tribes. But Hagar went through a lot for her child. Remember when Abraham told them to leave? Because those two mothers were fighting over those kids. That was Sarah and Hagar were fighting. It was a scary time. And Ishmael and Hagar were cast out. That would have been a hard time for a mother. And after that, Sarah's son on your outline, Isaac, grew up and married Rebekah. But birthing was hard for her. And she had Jacob and Esau. And it was hard for her because it says there were two nations inside of her womb, the Israelites and the Edomites. And also you remember the story about Esau and Jacob and their birthrights for the pot of beans. And Esau wanted to kill Jacob for Jacob actually getting the birthright. And that's why Rebecca sent Jacob away because she didn't want to lose both boys in one day like Eve did. And she really loved Jacob, but she never got to be with him again, ever. How sad for a mother. 
Now, Jacob married Rachel, and birthing was hard for her, too. She only had two kids, Joseph and Benjamin. And the birthing was hard for her and stuff. Earlier, Jacob was tricked into marrying Leah, Jacob's first wife, which was uh, Rachel's sister. And she had six kids. And it was so hard for Rachel because Leah was fertile, and Rachel couldn't have kids very easy. Rachel, finally, on your outline, had Joseph. But a few years later, died giving birth to Benjamin. But between those two mothers and their servants, we have the 12 tribes of Israel. 300 years later, we see on your outline, Joshebed, J-O-C-H-E-B-E-D, and Moses' mother in Egypt. And you can imagine what she went through, placing her baby in the water to escape death from Pharaoh. And you remember the story when Pharaoh's daughter found him, she kept him. And then Pharaoh's sister brought the baby back to Joshebeth, the baby's mother, for milk. And Pharaoh paid her to nurse the baby. So Joshebeth nursed Moses while she couldn't even keep him. That would be hard for a mother. And she prayed for Moses to, to live. And just think of the mothers that went through the desert for those 40 years. And when they were bitten by those poisonous snakes because of the murmuring about manna. And how happy they must have been when Moses made that brass serpent on the stick, which was a sign of the power of the cross. And all they just could just look at it and be saved because it symbolized Christ becoming sin for us. You know, it didn't take too long, a generation or two, before everybody started worshiping that stick. That, that is, until good King Hezekiah, about 500 years later, destroyed it. And he had a good mother, too. But what about after Moses? In Judges, we say Samson was mother. His mother was barren. She was called Manoah's wife. I don't know what her name is, just Manoah's wife. She prayed and prayed and prayed. And finally, she saw an angel that told her on your outline that she would have Samson. And it was an answer to prayer, persistent prayer. And so it, the answer came. The angel told her to raise him right, raise him like a Nazarite. But oh, what pain. She must have felt watching him shrug his responsibilities, living a wild lifestyle. What a waste. God was not happy with Samson, and neither was his mother. Then we look at the book of Ruth, and we see Naomi, her husband, Emelech, died. On your outline, Naomi was the mother of Malon and Chilion. And both of her boys died of a sickness after they were married. And left <laughs> Naomi, a widow with no boys, which was a tough situation in those days. And at that time, they lived in Moab. It was a heathen place. They had gone there because of a famine in their own country. And they went there. It drove them there. But Naomi was such a good and wonderful, nurturing mother that Ruth and Orpah were her daughters-in-law, wanted to be with her and stay with her. Both wanted to stay with her, but they were both cursed because they were Moabites, not allowed to go back to the Jewish nation. But we see that Naomi took Ruth back to Israel. Orpah stayed. And Naomi treated Ruth like her very own. Naomi was a very good mother. And later on, Ruth became a mother in the line of Jesus. And here she is, a Moabite, not a Jew at all. Then we come along. Next on your outline is Hannah, Samuel's mother, who was barren. She begged God for a child so much that she finally promised he, she finally promised that if she, she would get one, if he would give her one, rather, she would, on your outline, give him back to the Lord if he'd do it. She was married to a guy that had another wife and was having kids all over the place, and she couldn't have any. And so she prayed and prayed and got this child. She wanted it so bad, she promised that she'd give him to the Lord if he gave her one, and he did. Samuel means ask of God. The church raised him because of her promise, and she would visit him at the church. Now, in about 150 years later in Kings, we see Elijah. Elijah stayed with a widow lady and her boy, who thought that they were going to starve to death during a drought. But Elijah made an oil bottle and a grain barrel stayed full for many months, and they had to count on that empty barrel every day for food for months and months. Now, one day, her boy got sick and died, and Elijah, on your outline, brought him back to life. But what pain that mother has felt that day, and also what joy when he was raised up. And then we see after Elijah, we come to Elisha. During Elisha, there was a widow and two young boys whose husband died, leaving the family with a huge debt. Well, the creditor, knowing that she had no money, wanted the two boys to be sold as slaves for the payment. She didn't want to do that. She didn't know what to do. She went to Elisha for help. 
And he told her to borrow as many oil vessels, oil vessels as possible from the neighbors. And she took her last pot of oil, just one pot, and filled up every single one of all the other vessels. That's kind of like Elijah's story, too, isn't it? How the vessel kept filling back up. And when they were all full, she went and sold them all for the money that was owed for the creditors, and she saved her boys. But what a trial it was for that mother and her faith. When they were full, she just sold them, and she saved those boys. There's another story here in Elisha about a mother who was always kind to Elisha, and she let him stay with them. When he passed through, they built him a little hut. Now, her husband was very, very old, and they had no children, but because of her kindness, Elisha prayed on your outline, and God gave her a son. God made her a mother. Well, one day, a few years later, on the field, her boy's head was hurt, and right up to the point where he died. Well, the mother went to Elisha and got him, and on your outline, and Elisha healed the little boy and brought him back to life. Now, I was sort of like the Elijah story because they both brought a mother's only son back to life. Isn't that interesting? But oh, what joy that that mother must have felt as her only son came back to life. What a trial it must have been for those mothers, though, too. I think of 2 Kings with Josiah. It was a good king at year, eight years old he became king. And he had a revival on your outline at 16 years old. The Bible says it was a result of a good, godly mother. And did you know that every king's mother was listed, whether the king was good or bad? I think of Mary's mother and her trials, but watching her anointed daughter go through getting pregnant before she even had a husband. What they must have felt and what they must have endured. What she must have thought. Think of those trials. Finally, later on, we see Elizabeth and Mary. I bet they were the happiest mothers in the world when they were told that they were going to have their special anointed children, who was Jesus and John the Baptist, who later in life, John was beheaded and Jesus was crucified. Think of what, what Mary must have thought as she watched her perfect son through a mother's eyes be brutally beaten and then crucified on the cross in front of everybody naked. That wouldn't be easy for a mother. So summing it up, we see for every great man in the Bible on your outline, there was a mother who cared. So I want to ask you, did you have a mother that prayed for you? Did you have a mother that cared about you? Before us here in the Gospel of Matthew, we see we have a story of the persistent mother. And a mother who had a daughter who was in a desperate situation. And she was, this mother had heard about Jesus. And she brought her daughter to, to the Lord. And now we see in her model and in her life, we see the example of the importance of persistence in prayer. And this message is not just for mothers, but it's for anyone who wants to pray and see God answer in the affirmative. So we're going to start reading right now, and this is where we are in Matthew 15. I want you to <clears throat> turn with me, and we're going to read 21 through 28, the faith of the Canaanite woman. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but to unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yeah, but the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O oh, woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now you know something, in trying to understand the language and the culture, it looks kind of like I'm reading the text that didn't seem like Jesus cared at first, doesn't it? When Jesus was unconcerned with this woman's cries, and he just ignored her. And the plight of her daughter, it almost seemed like the Lord was rejecting her. But we have to keep in mind that Jesus responded to this mother in such a way he didn't want, he didn't want to destroy her faith. He wanted to develop her faith. And so we see he wasn't really playing games with her, nor was he trying to make an already difficult situation even worse. He was trying to draw her faith down, causing her to rise to the challenge. 
to stand as an example of how a woman uh, knew how to be persistent in her pleas, because women do. And it would show us how to pray more effectively. That's why this story is in there. But let's consider who this woman was. Well, we're told in verse 22, she was a woman of Canaan. That means that she was a non-Jew, a Gentile. Here we have another non-Jew. And Mark says that she was a Syrian Phoenician woman. And because of that, she probably been the worshiper of the false goddess of fertility and Ashtar. And also there was probably other pagan deities that she would bow down to also. And so we know that this woman was not raised with the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She was a woman who has, was raised with the belief of many gods. And that was very common in tradition, unlike many people from that culture. But she would have these little idols all around her house. And she had bowed down to these ones. And just like saints, they had one for every situation. And because of this, perhaps her own lifestyle is where she somehow, along the way, had invited some satanic influences in without even knowing that and somehow it just seemed to filter through to her daughter so much that her daughter actually became possessed by a demon. Or in her own words, it says her daughter was severely possessed. Now, saints, we have the hedge of Job. And once you've invited the Lord into your heart, that hole is filled. We cannot be possessed anymore, but we can sure be oppressed. But without the Lord, there is an empty place in your heart, and it can be filled with things by something or someone else on your outline when the Lord doesn't live there. Now, this must remind us of the importance of the influence of our parents, because our children are watching everything that we do. And it's so often that it's the parents that teach kids how to not go to church. They see it's not important to them. And once they say, go to church, we're not going. Pretty soon they want to be like their parents. They don't. The parents are the ones that keep, teach kids to go or not go. And the Bible tells us that the sins of the parents can be visited down to children. Now, I've heard that there's such thing as generational curses that may go into a family. But, you know, going back for years. But you have the power of Jesus. And because of that, you just need to go to God and ask him to break the curse on the family. You don't have to live under that. We have the power of God once you become born again. However, I really don't believe that the Bible even teaches a thing about having a curse on the family, having said such a thing, other than the prediction, or the prediction that God would do to certain people. But I certainly do think that there's a great influence from one generation to another. I mean, it's been found and proven by statistics on your outline that sins are passed down. And if you're an alcoholic, the chances of your kids ending up that way are higher than a child not raised in that environment. If you've been divorced, the chances are your children are getting a divorce are much higher than ones that did not have parents that were divorced. So you certainly do have influence on your child, and in more ways than you realize. And so we see that there was something about this woman's influence in Matthew 15 and that invited this devilish influence in. And so now she doesn't know what to do anymore. She doesn't know where to go. And you know, all you have to do is have a problem that's too big for you to handle. And guess what? That's what God is famous for. But many times the problem is that when we only, many of us will only come to God when we finally have a problem that's too big for us. And it's different. We were supposed to be with God all the time and would keep those problems from not being so big. And many times those problems is because it stems from not walking in the spirit. You're not listening to God. And it usually leads to a lot more problems than probably the great big problem you're in. And besides, when you don't walk with him daily, you're going to miss what God is trying to show you every day in your walk for your opportunities and the times that you should be sharing the Lord and the times that you have, should have more restraint, maybe, and the times that you should just be more obedient. But that's where this mother is. She's lost. And she has no place to turn. And we see that all of her false gods can't save her. Her religion can't get her out of this mess that she's gotten herself into. But somewhere she started hearing about this rabbi, this mysterious rabbi from Nazareth. And she heard of his miracles and she heard of his teaching and healings. And she just knew that somehow that she could get to Jesus with her daughter. He would heal her. God had given her enough light. And she believed that he could touch her and heal her. And so she believed. The light gets you there. But when you get him, you get life. But the light got her there. And he, in that she would want to get her there to get her delivered from this evil influence. Well, we find out in verse 22, she cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. 
Look at how Jesus responds in verses 23 here. Um, 15, 23, it says, But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he didn't answer a word. Have you ever spoken to someone and they don't answer you back? Isn't that rude? I mean, they don't even acknowledge your presence. You say something to them and they look at you and walk away. They don't even look your way sometimes. And I mean that you don't act as though he even heard you. And you know that they could have heard you. And I mean that they should have heard you and everything. So what's your act, reaction supposed to be when somebody does something like that? Well, you'd obviously say, they don't want to talk to me. They don't want to hear from me. You kind of take the hint. Well, the disciples saw that, how Jesus did that. And so they thought, well, we better send her away. Because it was apparent that he was, she was creating quite a scene and it didn't seem like Jesus wanted to talk to her. And it sounds kind of like she was yelling very loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is severely demon-possessed, and she's suffering terribly. And the disciples would say, Lord, would you get rid of this woman? She's creating a big scene, a big commotion. And Jesus just doesn't answer her word. What is the point of all this? Here it is. Jesus could see into her heart. Jesus could see all about her. And he could see that this woman, that there was a tenacious, persistent faith that would rise to this occasion. And so we see he wasn't putting up barriers to keep her away, but rather to draw her closer. Because he knew that she would rally on, and he knew that she would press on because her heart was so. And that's why he did this. And it was to teach the disciples who were often lacking in faith. A lesson to give us a perspective and a mode of how to pray effectively. And it took a mother, a secular mother, to do it to show them. And I don't want to say secular because she came to Jesus, and I'm sure she was saved after that. But a Gentile mother to do it. And But she keeps pressing on still, just like a mother, seeking Jesus with persistence. And Jesus says to the Gentile woman, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it through the mangy curs, dogs. Who are the children on your outline? The children are Israel. What's food or bread? It's spirit of God or the word of truth? It's Jesus. Who's the dogs? They are Gentiles, two-legged dogs. Gentiles are two-legged dogs, non-Jews. But she comes right back and says, oh yeah, but even, not the mangy curs, but even the little puppies get the food that falls from the master's table, was her word. And you know, I believe that smile came over his face and just rose to the challenge with her persistence because God wants to be pursued. And after putting up a barrier of silence and then a second barrier of seeming rejection, Jesus heard what he wanted to hear and he makes this alarming statement. Look at it says in verse 28, it says this, then Jesus answered and said unto her, O oh, woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. O oh, woman, you have great faith. <laughs> Let it be as you have desired. I think the disciples' mouths must have just dropped to the floor when they heard him say that. They thought he wanted to get rid of her. And then he said, I'll give you anything you want. <laughs> A moment ago, she was acknowledging this lady's presence, presence at all. He wasn't even acknowledging it. And, he, had to, and she, he essentially just dismisses her. And it's because she is persistent and presses on. He shifts gears and says, I'll give you whatever you want, Mark Blanche. You go ahead and name it. So what brought all this about? What made the change? How did he know? Why did he do it then? Well, here in this message, we come to the idea on your outline, why we should pray how we should pray, and the way we should pray to get results. And here it is. Number one on your outline, because of her attitude. Jesus said to her, it's because of your persistence, tenacity, and commitment. You see, even when the door was shut in her face, she kept on knocking on it. And what Christ calls her a dog, a mangy cur, she only picks up what he said like a good puppy and picks it up and drops it at the master's feet. Is that like for you? Is that the way you are with the Lord when you're chastened? Is that how you feel? Do you feel like when you're in a problem that he is the only place to turn? You should. I tell you, she had such faith that she simply could not go home without, on your outline, a blessing. She wasn't going to go home without it. 
And she said, Lord, my daughter has a problem, and I'm not leaving until it's restored. You know, this always reminds me of the story of Jacob wrestling with what he thought was an angel when we later on discovered it was God himself. And you remember as Jacob was wrestling, trying to prevail over the Lord, he realized that he couldn't and he would not when the Lord touched his hip. Finally, he said to the Lord, begging, I will not let you go until you bless me. You have to bless me. I'm not letting you go. Well, that's just a physical illustration. But that is the kind of persistence that we need in prayer. Jesus said, knock and the door shall be opened. Seek and you shall find. Ask and it will be given to you. And if you look at the original language, it's translated, keep on knocking, keep on seeking, keep on asking. You know, we see that this is shown to us when Jesus told us the parable of the persistent widow as she pleads for justice. I wasn't going to read it, and then I decided I would. So I'm going to turn there right now, Luke 18, 1 through 8, to show some more persistence. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought to always pray and not to faint. Saying, there was in the city a judge who, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterwards he said within himself, Though I fear not God, I'm not worried about it. Nor regard man, I'm not scared of him. But this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not the God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find that kind of faith on earth? Will there be persistent prayers when the Lord comes? How many intercessors will there be? How much time do you spend intercessing for other people? If someone keeps knocking at your door and they don't stop, and you may finally answer them just to get them to go away, but we've got to remember that that's not how God feels toward us because God compares his love for us on your outline as a nursing mother's love for a nursing child. That mother would do anything for that baby. That's how God loves us. But on the other hand, he wants our faith to grow. So he commands us and gives us trials and pressures to press on. But many times we give up so easily and we may pray about something once and if it's not answered right away, we say, well, I guess that's not in the will of God. That's not in the will. And then we just move on to another thing. When I say our request can show our real heart's desire, it shows how bad do you want it. That is your heart. What is it that you want and how bad do you want it? That is your heart. And we must keep praying on your outline as an example for others. This is a lesson for us as parents. Let kids see you pray. Let them see the parents pray. Now maybe you have a son or a daughter that's taken a prodigal turn and then they have hit rock bottom and they see their need for, before they've even seen their need for God. And what we've learned from these mothers is that you need to keep praying. Don't give up. Keep praying for them. Pray for them. Maybe you have prodigal parents and you're praying for your mom and dad to come to faith. And it seems like nothing has happened. I understand this. I really do. However, I've been shown that many people don't get their prayers answered until the last moment. Huh, God is faithful. You know, there's a lot of thieves on the cross. A lot of people that only figure it out at the very end. And so we know that salvation for them may come at the end. That's the way it was for my dad. I must have prayed for him for 30 years. And finally he came to the Lord, you know. It takes losing all your functions. And you can see that when there's no place to turn, there's always up. <laughs> it might come in a month. Their conversion might take years. But we've got to remember this. It might come tomorrow. So don't give up. When my dad converted, it was just... It just spelled like the cup was overflowed and it was time. It wasn't anything in particular that day that was said. It was just that one day he realized it. The mothers give us a truly example of this kind of love of not giving up. So always remember, keep praying, because even though that person you're praying for might escape your presence, they can never escape your prayers. 
You know, a signal bastard once said, men may spurn our appeals, reject our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. So keep praying. And don't give up. Be patient and watch God work. Keep praying. However, the devil will whisper in your ear always, forget it. The situation is never going to change. And he'll say, forget it. It's always going to be the same way. It's always going to be the same as it's always been. No, 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 that's not true. He is the father of lies. And we know that God can make circumstances in your life that can change your situation, even if you can't. We have learned from this woman the importance of being tenacious and to being persistent in our prayers. And secondly, the reason that Jesus gave this woman everything she asked for is because number two on your outline, she got her will in alignment with God. Remember what he said? What is it that you want? Maybe I'll give you whatever you want. What is it? And she said, I want my daughter to be delivered. And so why did he say all of that to her? He'll give her anything that she wants. Because her will, he knew, was in alignment with his. She didn't want anything else other than the salvation of her daughter. And that is what we want to do when we pray. We want to get her will, like our will, in alignment with his will. Now, know this, the point is, is not to move God my way. It is about me moving me God's way. And this is what we have to remember. Let's read what it says in 1 John 3, 22. It says this. It says, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. When we receive from him anything we ask because on your outline, we obey his commandments and we do what pleases him. Can you say that? But that's the key. That's to get my will in alignment with the will of God. When we obey his commands, the ones that we do know, he will reveal his will. Somebody once said he knows the great desires of heavenly things, and when your desires are such that God approves of them, and when you want what God wills, that's when you will have what you like. Can we remember that? When you want what God wills, that's when you can have whatever you like. What is it that you really want right now? What are the things that you're hoping for? Is it for more earthly things? Or is it for salvation of a son or daughter or grandson or grandmother or salvation of a husband or wife or mother or father? Maybe an enemy. Maybe it's just someone that you know and you want them to get closer to God. But then again, perhaps it could be some kind of a removal of some kind of a disability or some kind of problem or an answer about that. Well, listen, keep praying. Just say, Lord, intervene in this situation, and he will. You know, you could take the approach that God just won't do it unless he wants to, or whenever he wants to. But don't think like that at all. God told us to keep asking and keep seeking and to do it soon. You need to pray like this. Would you save this person now? Lord, would you heal me now? But, you know, we got to put the big P.S. on the end of it. We always have to remember that. It is nevertheless not my will, but your will be done. But we're supposed to pray for things now. Remember, Paul didn't get his thorn taken out of his flesh. No. And remember, Elisha, he died from sickness. No. And remember, the apostles all died a horrible death. Where was God? He was right there. It's like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, not my will then, but your will. We got to remember that we need to be strong and bold for God and that everything isn't going to be hunky dory. We got to make sure that we are in God's will and sometimes we'll have to do some things we don't want to do. Sometimes when we're in a prayer on your outline, sometimes God says, wait. And then sometimes God says, no. But sometimes God is looking at your heart. And I mean, how bad do you want it? And He's doing a lot of that. He also, on your outline, how persistent are you going to be? You know, I always think about, you know, it shows how much you believe in God for the answer when you really put your faith like that. So you don't want to give up. Don't stop being persistent with your prayers. Remember this, all of your prayers are recorded. Do you know that? Isn't that interesting? Every prayer is recorded. And so tell me, how big is your prayer file? Or that problem you're dealing with? Or how big is your prayer file? How full are those vials before they tip over and God answers your prayer? How many prayers have you prayed for your problem? 
What about your appointed prayers for other people, for someone to come to the Lord? Do you know how many questions that were not answered in the Bible? It says something like 300. They were never asked. They were never asked. Because why? <laughs> what is a prayer that is not spoken? Good intentions. <laughs> the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So if you're not going to say the words and ask the prayer, you're not doing your part. It's like this, no words, no power, no results, period. You know, it's true that your action and motives start in the heart, and God can see it, but you have the responsibility to put your heart into action and get results and get to work. And what is faith? Belief with legs on it, right? That means you do something about it. You just don't talk about it. You start praying some things into completion and for the fullness now. Listen, prayer is a Christian's weapon, so we let's use it. Realize crisis is a chance to show your faith. So pray. Character is built during trials, not when things are going well. Are you building character? And finally, ultimately, I think love is demonstrated more often than not in a mother's love for her children. You know, I think it's another little closer picture of God's love for us. So finally, in conclusion, as we keep our eyes on Jesus, let's be thankful that God has placed these great, this great love right inside of every single mom. And also, as we keep our eyes on him, let's remember that this love is only a part of the great love that Jesus has for us. But let's thank God for mothers. Let's pray that they might, with their persistence and their tenacity and commitment to God, that they might guide our young loved ones to the great and mighty Savior. Oh, what a mighty purpose mothers have. So really, we thank God for mothers on this Mother's Day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for mothers. I thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for teaching us about being persistent in prayers. And I thank you that we were able to use an illustration of moms to show us how important persistence is and how that they are very persistent. Lord, I just pray that you would just touch hearts with this message and help them to not give up the ship when it comes to faith in you and to just be patient and wait and just seek you diligently, Lord. For you said if you seek you, if you are seek, you'll they will find you with a whole heart. If we seek with a whole heart, you will find them, you will help them. And so, Lord, I pray that this persistence would prevail in their prayer life. And I just thank you, Lord, that maybe with this persistence it might help create more boldness in them, that they really would see more opportunities in their life that they could use to share the gospel. But even so, Lord, we thank you for your message. We thank you for mothers, and we thank you for all that might be able to hear the message and be able to go ahead and, and uh, pray some mothers in their life and let them know how special they are. We thank you again, Lord, for this, this message and for all the mothers and for all that are listening. I pray that you would just bless each and every one. We thank you and ask for these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Praise the Lord. But we have one last song. If you want to sing with us at home, and uh, we're going to sing Give Thanks. So here we go. <clears throat> one last song. Go like this. Here we go. <coughs> Give thanks to the grateful. Give with a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son.
much to be thankful for. Help us to count our blessings as we seek you with a whole heart and help us to be the people you want us to be. Bless the people really good, Lord, and just take care of this virus thing and send the people back to church when it's time. But I pray that you would just bless each and every one of them and let them have a, have a hedge of protection and joy in their heart and a spring in their step and a motive in their life to share you with others. Lord, we thank you for everything you're doing. We love you so much. And I thank you for the church and the people and everything you do and everything you stand for. We love you, Lord. We love the truth. And we ask for all of these things in your precious name we pray. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. 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 Go with God. Have a great day. And we thank you so much. And we just hope you tune in. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.